Good evening. Now, it's fair to say it's not exactly been the dream start, shall we say, for the new leader of the Scottish National uh, Party, First Minister Hamza Youssef. Today, the party's treasurer, Colin Beattie, resigned following his arrest yesterday. And there's questions too about finances for the Prime Minister here in Westminster, where she's seen next wife shares in a childcare firm that could benefit from a policy in last month's budget were declared in his financial interests a little earlier. So let's crack straight on. We're going to start with the best bits of the week so far. The former US Secretary of State Hillary Clinton is hosting a three-day conference at Queen's University in Belfast to mark 25 years of the Good Friday Agreement. Well, they've reassembled most of the surviving class of 1998 to mark the 25th anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement. Now, there can be no doubt that people in Northern Ireland today enjoy safety and security much more than those who had lived through the previous decades that they could have only dreamed of. If we can take inspiration and instruction from the way peace was achieved 25 years ago, we can fulfill the true promise enshrined in that agreement. We start with breaking news and the turmoil within the SNP. The party's treasurer, Colin Beattie, is stepping back from the role and also from Holyrood's public audit committee. The party has to get its house in order. Uh, that's what the public would expect. It's not helpful. Uh, of course, I wanted to, and I will, I'm still determined, of course, uh, to articulate what my vision is uh, as a new leader uh, and a fresh start uh, for uh, the government. Economists had forecast that today would be the day the inflation rate finally fell back to single figures. However, it wasn't to be. It did fall slightly, but it still remains above 10%. The UK now has the highest inflation rate of anywhere in Western Europe. It's absolutely essential that we stick to that plan and we see it through so that we halve inflation this year, as the Prime Minister has promised. The document that's dropped is this. It's the list of ministerial interests. Prime Minister's wife invests in a number of companies. We now know one of those, but there is nothing in the Prime Minister's declaration telling us what else she invests in. Because they've created the largest court yep. backlog on record, yes. he's letting violent criminals go free. Yeah. That's why they call him Sir Softy. Yeah. Soft on crime, soft on criminals. Yeah. They call him Mr. Softy. Well, she's seen it perhaps uh, calling him uh, Mr. Softy uh, there. Not sure exactly who else. But let's start this evening, shall we, in Belfast and the events to mark the 25th anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement. Bill and Hillary Clinton joined the Prime Minister, Tony Blair and others at Queen's University in the city, from where I spoke to the Northern Ireland Secretary, Chris Heaton-Harris, a little earlier. And I started, though, by asking about the news today about inflation still being above 10% and food inflation close to double that. Um, yeah, of course, of course I understand how difficult things are. And actually, uh, um, as a former fruit and veg wholesaler, um, I've actually keenly watched the price of fresh, uh, fresh fruit and veg as it's been uh, rising over the last few months. And that's been one of the key contributors to our inflation figures. Um, I, I'm actually quite confident those figures will come, come down now as, uh, as the seasons change. Um, but, you know, the government's been trying to help people. And this, uh, the, the most recent uh, version of that has been a cost of living uh, payment to those who um, are eligible that's just gone out this week. One of Rishi Sunak's five pleasures was to halve inflation this year. Are you still confident that's going to happen? Um, I, I think we are still confident that's, that's going to happen. And I believe um, that, I mean, I, I'm pretty sure, I'm trying to remember if it was the IMF or an, another forecaster I, I saw a couple of weeks ago saying that we should uh, be able to do that. So, yes. I know that there is an argument made by some that pay rises help to stoke inflation. But at the same time, can you understand why, if you're a public sector worker and you're seeing how inflation is rising, how food prices are rising, how difficult things are, and your only way to try and effectively make ends meet is to go on strike? You know, you've given nurses 5%, you've given teachers 4.5%. Inflation's currently over 10%. Is that enough? Um, yeah, I mean, I've I, I obviously not been involved in those, those processes, but um, and I'm pleased to see that some of the unions um, have been settling uh, at, the, at those levels. But, yeah, I, I, am, I am acutely aware, especially here in Northern Ireland, where... Nurses and teachers, um, sorry, haven't settled uh, at those levels, have they? Nurses rejected the RCN... Uh, well, no, nurses Unison did, accepted, but, uh, but the I RCN uh, Unison, Unison accepted rejected it. it. Yeah. And, and teachers haven't accepted 4.5% either. 
Yeah, I, I mean, to, to me, I mean, these are ongoing negotiations for those unions uh, 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 with, with the employers and and the government. And um, but you know, Unison did accept uh, that that level. I, I but I, I am acutely aware, especially in the Northern Ireland context, that uh, you know inflation is troublesome for every household, and um, we have a huge number of people who are economically inactive uh, over here in, in Northern Ireland. Um, who this is a really tough time for, which is why the government's help in the cost of living uh, payments that are coming through um, it, it is, is equally vital. So, uh, yeah, these are pressures that are on everybody, though. And, and uh, 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 whilst I know um, probably your follow-up question will be why, uh, why is inflation slightly higher in the United Kingdom than it is in the rest of Europe, but food infl it's, it's food prices that is driving inflation across the piece. Yeah, but given that food price inflation is so high, shouldn't you be looking at trying to help public sector uh, workers who don't have control over their pay packets because they're stacked by the government. Yeah, and that's, that's, I mean, this is all part of the negotiations and, as I say, uh, some unions have decided to settle for the, le uh, the level of offer that's been given and, uh, and there are ongoing negotiations with others. Now, the Northern Ireland executive is still not up and running, uh, which is an astonishing, extraordinary situation. You're the Northern Ireland secretary. Do you accept responsibility or some responsibility for this failure? Um, uh, no, I think we are trying to find the solutions to the problems. Uh, uh, the, one of the reasons, the main reason, that the Democratic Unionist Party left the, uh, the executive, and remember, we, we are here, the backdrop behind me is Queen's University, Belfast, where we are marking the 25th anniversary of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement, which set up the institutions, uh, many, uh, many institutions, one of, them, one of the most key ones being uh, the ex uh, Stormont, the executive, uh, having MLAs elected, um, and Stormont is run on a, on a very different basis to uh, many other legislatures ac across the world because of the unique circumstances in Northern Ireland. It's, it's on the principle of consent. You need the consent of both communities uh, to get it up and running. In the past, Sinn Féin um, have, have collapsed Stormont. Uh, this time it's the Democratic Unionist Party, and they were concerned about uh, the impact of the Northern Ireland Protocol um, was having here. And I'd like to think through the Windsor framework, we have managed to solve a number, uh, the, uh, the vast number of those issues. And now we are talking um, to the Democratic Unionist Party and, and Unionist communities um, about getting their politicians back into power sharing because that's what is required here to, for the smooth and effective delivery of public services. And, um, and here in Northern Ireland, public services are more challenged than just about every other place in the United Kingdom. You say that the DP aren't prepared to enter power sharing because of the protocol. Some would argue that actually that's effectively a fig leaf, that the real reason they don't want to get it back into power sharing is because they can't stomach the idea of a First Minister from Sinn Féin. Do you think that's the real truth? Um, well, certainly I've heard Sir Geoffrey Donaldson say absolutely categorically, and I've got no reason to disbelieve him, that that is definitely not the case. Um, and um, and I, I've spoken to a whole host of, uh, uh, as you would expect, DUP MLAs and, and others from the uni uh, from unionist community. No, that, that's uh, I, I truly believe that is not the reason. So it's because they think that the Brexit deal is bad. Um, I, I well, uh, what they would like to see, and we, we've had this discussion on panels uh, here over the last couple of days. I, I believe what the DUP would like to see is a, a restatement by uh, the government of the United Kingdom about uh, the importance mm -hmm. and the position. Uh, uh, of Northern Ireland as an integral part of the United Kingdom um, and that's something I'd like to think I, I have done uh, here and the Prime Minister will do later today. Now honestly, like taking the political sort of speak away, how close or how far do you think the DUP are from re-entering power sharing? What is going on in the conversations and how optimistic are you? Uh, I, mean, I mean, that's a really difficult one because um, I, 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 I'm, now, I'm now waiting to hear uh, back from the Democratic Unionist Party as to uh, exactly what they uh, uh, would like us to do as a UK government to, uh, to kind of restate what we are doing here, that Northern Ireland is an integral part of the United Kingdom based on the Belfast Good Friday Agreement uh, where we're marking the 25th anniversary here today um, and will remain so unless the people of Northern Ireland want to change that. No politician's um, words or, or views can, can change that. So. Um, I think you'll find that the government of the United Kingdom is very keen and happy to restate how important it is that um, we are, how proud we are of having Northern Ireland as part of the United Kingdom. Um, but we're waiting for uh, a, a Democratic Unionist Party uh, 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 friends and colleagues to um, tell us how they would like that to be uh, to, to be stated, so we can do it properly. Because I'm keen, just as everybody else is, to get uh, to get the 
the institutions here up and running. I mean, I have to admit that, you know, if it was all as simple as just the UK government saying that we're happy and proud for Northern Ireland to be part of the union, I'm sure it would have been fixed by now. It feels to me like, actually, there's much more thorny and difficult issues at stake, like the role of the European courts uh, in Northern Ireland, uh, for example. Uh, at what point do you say, look, this is not working, I'm going to call another election? Um, well, I've, or actually, I do have the power to call um, an election here in Northern Ireland. I don't think it would be helpful at this stage. Um, and I have that, uh, I have that power all the, all the way through to, the, uh, to early 2024. Uh, um, so, but I, I, to me, that is the kind of uh, uh, the ultimate uh, backstop. And I, it's not something I'd be keen to do. Everybody tells me here that it would just polarise the situation um, across society uh, more uh, than it is polarised now. And that's not what... <clears throat> that's, that's not an aim uh, uh, that I have or, or, the, or the government has. So we, we want the institutions up and running. Um, we've heard some good words from uh, Jeffrey Donald, Sir Jeffrey Donaldson, um, a former MP who uh, is a high-ranking uh, uh, MLA, Emma Little Pengeli, um, here at this conference. Um, and I truly believe that we can get there. Um, remember, it wasn't that long ago that the Windsor Framework um, uh, became public, as it were, and was adopted. It was less than a month ago that it was actually uh, voted on in the uh, House of Commons and went through the Joint Committee, uh, and there's a there's a lot of <laughs> there's an awful lot uh, in in the Windsor framework. Took a lot of negotiation, and so that's why we've tried to give as much time and space um, to the, to the unionist communities and their political representatives to digest all that. Um, but I like to think we are getting to the point where that is you know, um, that is being well understood. That negotiation between the UK and the EU is over. It's all about implementation and demonstrating that it does exactly what it says it does. You said this week the ongoing stalemate instalment was the single biggest threat to the union. What do you mean by that? Yeah, I, so, um, so this is one of the... Uh, uh, Stormont, the, the executive and, uh, uh, and the, uh, the MLAs are one of the key, key parts, it's a key part of the Belfast Good Friday um, agreement. Having, I'd, li I'd like to think that what we've been able to deliver with the Windsor Framework, which does put uh, uh, Northern Ireland in a, in a unique position within our uh, union, um, uh, helps uh, guarantee uh, Northern Ireland as part of our union for a very long time uh, to come. And I think when people do not see their institutions up and running um, and public services are falling back with, uh, compared with the rest of the United Kingdom, uh, then they start to wonder whether, they, uh, whether that institution is worth having. And actually, at the end of the day, um, maybe uh, you know, look uh, uh, to other places to try and deliver the, uh, or, or maybe believe that another constitutional setup will deliver those services. We're not in that space. So are you effectively saying then that you know, frustration with Stormont, frustration perhaps with the DUP in particular, could push people to supporting a United Ireland? What is happening here is that you know we've got local elections in Northern Ireland that are a tiny bit later than in the in the rest of the United Kingdom on May the 18th. Um, there'll be an interesting test uh, of, of of local opinion, but um, you know, unionist communities should be uh, comfortable and in knowing that they that the the government of the United Kingdom wants them to remain a a strong part of our United Kingdom. Uh, for as long as they want to. The only thing that can change that um, is uh, uh, the people, the voices, uh, the, you know, the votes of the people of Northern Ireland um, in the future. So they are in complete control of their own destiny. Um, so I actually think you know, the union is as, uh, is as strong here as it's ever been and, and going to get stronger through what we've managed to deliver through the Windsor framework. Um, and what I'm trying to say is that now we need the institutions of the Good Belfast Good Friday Agreement to be up and running to demonstrate uh, to people that their votes count, that their views count um, and that democracy counts. Um, while I've got you, uh, we've just had the list of ministers' interests drop. And I just want to have a look at the section from the Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, because there has been some questions about his wife's involvement in a company called Cory Kids and whether or not there was a conflict of interest uh, with some of the childcare arrangements that he's announced. So 
in the declaration it says the Prime Minister's wife is a venture capital investor. She owns a venture capital investment company, Catamaran Ventures UK, and a number of direct shareholdings. It then goes on to say, as the PM set out in his letter to the chair of the liaison committee, this includes the minority shareholding that his wife has in relation to the company Coru Kids. Why is he only declaring the one company that has been outed in the media? Shouldn't he not be declaring all of the companies that his wife has an involvement with to avoid any idea of a conflict of interest? Um, I mean, this, I'm afraid, Sophie, because this is part of an ongoing investigation, I'm not going to comment on, the, on this sort of thing. Um, uh, when, 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 it's, uh, when this is all over, I'm, I'm quite sure things will be completely clear. I'm talking not specifically about Cora Kids. I'm talking about why isn't he being more open about his wife's business dealings? Uh, I think you're being fairly specific about the Prime Minister and his, his interests. There's, not, uh, there's an investigation going on uh, and I'm going to wait to the end of that. Well, Chris Hayton Harris, they're being very careful not to be drawn uh, on the Cory Kids uh, argument. Let's talk to Sam Cates, our deputy uh, political editor, uh, shall we? Sam, I want to talk to you a bit more widely about trust in politics, right? Because it feels like there's been a lot about this, about how much we should care about it, about whether various scandals are cutting through. Co the Cory Kids stuff, the Rishi Sunak stuff first. How big a deal do you think this is? I mean, you're right, Sophie, because there just are a lot of issues around at the moment connected with conduct, and you there were asking the Northern Ireland Secretary about this company, Coru Kids, that benefited from the last budget uh, that Jeremy Hunt gave as part of a package of funding to nurseries. And it turns out that the Prime Minister's wife actually has invested in that company. And we can see that declared today here. And that's the story that on Sky News we've been talking about, and that's the publication of the Ministerial Register of Interests. And uh, it makes reference to the fact that she invests in venture capital. Uh, uh, she's a venture capitalist and that uh, Corey Kids is one of the uh, firms that she invests in. They don't say what the other ones are because the Ministerial uh, Laurie Magnus, uh, advisor, Mo Laurie Magnus, argues that would be too intrusive to her. So there is a sort of question that I suspect just simply won't be uh, resolved about what happens if uh, prime ministerial spouses invest in uh, companies where there is a sort of public interest and public uh, government decisions about that. But the judgment of the government is we're not going to find out about it. But what's interesting about that story is that of the three issues around at the moment to do with conduct, I think this one's probably the least important. Let's look at the next one. And it's all connected to one man. He is... You'll be familiar with him, Deputy Prime Minister, Justice Secretary Dominic Raab. Now, we could get the report into his behaviour maybe as soon as tomorrow, maybe even tomorrow morning. There has been a long-running investigation into multiple allegations of bullying by him at successive government departments. And Rishi Sunak, on receipt of that report, has got to decide whether or not to keep him in his job. Although he has said to me before that if he's found guilty, then he'll resign, right? So we'll have to find out uh, whether or not he actually makes good on that uh, tomorrow. He's obviously denied uh, the allegations. He thinks that he'll be cleared. What's going to be interesting about the report is I don't think it's going to judge whether he is a bully or not. It's going to set out the facts and then it's going to be for Rishi Sunak to determine whether or not that breaks the ministerial code, mm -hmm. is conduct unbecoming and he should go. It's just worth saying, Dominic Raab is the number two in government. He stood in for Boris Johnson when Boris Johnson was at death's door with COVID. And here we are talking about him nearly departing government. It's like almost a surprise that this isn't bigger news, but it's not. It'll ramp up tomorrow. But even if he does go, will it have much of a ripple? But even this, the second most senior politician in Westminster, possibly on the precipice, about to go, is nothing in comparison to this. This is not just any motorhome, right? Explain well, this picture. <laughs> this, as you would know, is a Nielsman and Bischoff camper van. Now, this is not the camper van uh, <laughs> that was found on the driveway of Nicola Sturgeon's mother-in-law. clarification. But it is a camper van. But I, I, I didn't want pictures of tarpaulin and police. I wanted this picture. So you can, you can see the type of vehicle at the heart of the most extraordinary scandal going on in Scotland at the moment. Now, we don't concentrate enough sometimes in Westminster about the affairs uh, uh, up north of the border nearly as much as we should, but it is extraordinary. The police in Scotland are investigating uh, missing funds. It turns out that the accountants for the SNP resigned. The wife, uh, sorry, the husband of former First Minister Nicola Sturgeon has been arrested uh, and stood down as uh, uh, chairman of the party. You have uh, the Treasurer are stepping back today after he too uh, was arrested. Um, and one of the things that has happened is it has turned out that the SNP 
own a motorhome. Uh, now, the idea was that they were going to spend £110,000 on a vehicle such as this in order to take it campaigning around Scotland in the 2000 and, uh, uh, I think it was 2021 election campaign. Now, they didn't end up doing that because of COVID. It's a bit of a waste of money. But why is it in on Nicola Sturgeon's husband's mother's drive? It has now been impounded by police. Hamza Yusuf, the new leader of the SNP, found out about all of this after he was elected. He had no idea that there was a caravan that may or may not uh, have been the, uh, uh, the, the fruits of wise or unwise spending by his predecessor. But the problem is there's a black hole, funding unaccounted for, it would appear, police investigating. It's the kind of thing that can topple entire parties and change the political makeup of a country. And that's what Labour and the Conservatives are, happening, might happen, are hoping might happen in Scotland next year. It's extraordinary, particularly because it did feel for a time like the SNP were untouchable uh, in Scotland. Um, thank you very much, Sam, for your analysis, as always. We'll have more from Sam later in the programme. Uh, you're watching The Take. We are live in Westminster. Up next, we're going to be talking to Lisa Nandy, Labour's shadow levelling up secretary. don't always come from big cities. I'm Lisa Dowd and I'm Sky's Midlands correspondent and this is where I grew up. We can reveal that the driver who hit Harry Dunn is 42-year-old Anne Sekoulas. Just met the president and we never thought we'd get this far. This is what they're up against, that the wind is the really big problem. It is back-breaking work and the smoke is thick. It's been working well. Water levels are dropping, but no one knows what impact further rain will have. What would you do if this place wasn't open? So. We take you to the heart of the stories that shape our world. It's really scary. We're terrified. In this community, I'm told that everybody knows someone affected by COVID. Hopefully this will be the last wave. I never knew they would make it. It's amazing. Change seems tantalisingly close in this corner of the UK. Wales was the first to introduce the plastic bag charge. This is my patch, my specialism. It's also my home. Welcome back live to Westminster. You're watching The Take. We can get the view now from Labour. A little earlier, I spoke to the party's shadow levelling up secretary, Lisa Nandy.
Thanks very much for being on the programme. Um, let's start with Northern Ireland. We had Chris Heaton Harris on the programme a little earlier, and he said he's optimistic that Stormont is going to get back up and running. Are you? Well, I hope he's right, and I think he's right to try and strike that tone. We've had a week where we've been reminded of what can be achieved on the island of Ireland, what has historically been achieved when political parties come together and work together in the interests of the people. And I think he's right to lay down the challenge to parties across Northern Ireland that power sharing needs to get back up and running who very you, quickly. Who do you blame for the impasse? I, I think, I, I don't want to get into the blame game, but I think that the biggest problem at the moment is that the trust is not there. And when there have been these moments, ever since the Good Friday Agreement was negotiated and then signed, the, the, the thing that has unlocked it has been the emergence of an honest broker, usually the UK Prime Minister, who has been able to personally intervene in order to bring people together and to resolve the situation. And the truth is, and this is, you know, not a blame game, point at all but the truth and the reality is that since Theresa May signed the deal with the DUP that has been a very difficult thing for all political parties in Northern Ireland to accept and there is a lot of work to do to restore the trust to ensure that political parties in Northern Ireland all feel that there is an honest broker in this situation why and the personal Rishi involvement Sunak? of Rishi Sunak is really important. Why, why isn't he an honest broker here? I mean he managed to broker a deal with the EU. Well, I, I think the Conservative Party's record and ability to manage that process has been tarnished. But we're talking about the current Prime Minister, but right, it, not the, not the past. Sure. I mean, he was a present feature of that government all the way through, particularly through the Boris Johnson years. Uh, he was a very senior member of the government, and I think that is a problem. But I think with goodwill, with the involvement of the US President, which we've seen in the last couple of weeks, with the involvement of the Irish Taoiseach and with the involvement of the UK Prime Minister and the will to make this work, I think we could see progress and I think it's right that all political parties come together and try. Chris Aiton Harris also said that if people lose faith in the institutions of Northern Ireland, which will happen if Stormont doesn't get back together, um, that could lead to a rise in Irish nationalism. He describes that as the biggest threat to the union. Is he right? I, th I think when people lose faith in the system itself, that you've got a real problem on your hands. And I, I don't want to downplay the seriousness of what we're seeing um, in Northern Ireland and on the island of Ireland, but I also think there is a problem across the whole of the United Kingdom with people increasingly feel that they don't have faith in the political system to resolve problems for them, to make their lives better. And, you know, might just gently say to Chris Heaton-Harris that the Conservative government bears some responsibility for that, that the actions that we've seen, particularly of the Prime Minister, the last two Prime Ministers that we've had, of Liz Truss and Boris Johnson, have not gone any way to restoring trust or confidence in government. And I think it is incumbent on this incarnation what, what of the exactly, Conservative Party what, to what, sort that what, out. What, what exactly are you talking about there, though? The, 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 Carrying out Brexit? I mean, no, what, what's the... no, not at all. Look, I, I, I was a Remain campaigner, I make no secret of that, and I, I wanted us to stay in the European Union, but I accepted the result, as did most politicians mm. at the time, and worked very hard hard alongside Conservative so what, and Labour so, politicians so, so to make that work. What, what, what I, think we've, I think we've eroded trust in... I, I think the government has eroded trust in politics. I think particularly of what happened during the pandemic, where there was um, a, a government that made the rules and then broke the rules, that lied about it and laughed about it. I think of the promises that were made around Brexit by okay. the... Boris Johnson government in particular, of which Rishi Sunak was a huge part, where promises were made that we would have oven-ready Brexit deals, that the situation in Northern Ireland would not be a problem at all, that it could all be resolved. And all political parties in Northern Ireland uh, feel very betrayed and let down by that period Let's in government. So there is, about, there is work to do. Talking about trust in politics, I want to talk about the SNP uh, as well, uh, because we have seen the situation with Colin uh, Beattie resigning as SNP treasurer after he was arrested as part of a police investigation into the party finances. How damaging is this? Well, I think the biggest damage is what it's doing to the people of Scotland, because at the moment what they've got is a failing government at Westminster and a failing government at Holyrood. If you look at what is happening in Scotland at the moment, I think the things that I would be most concerned about are the record waiting times for A&E, the rising homelessness, the record number of drug deaths, all things that are going you, untackled because they've got two failing governments you, um, that are mad in controversy. And do you think there's a problem uh, that the uh, new First Minister is seen as a continuity candidate? Well, I, I, you don't have to listen to me on that. Uh, the, the SNP itself thinks so. His uh, 
uh, challenger in the leadership contest herself believed that he was one of the most failing ministers in government and that his record spoke for himself. I think the bigger problem, actually, is that the SNP doesn't seem to be able to pull itself out of this and focus on the country and the interests of the people in the country in front of them. Instead, we've had this endless merry-go-round of accusations and recriminations. It's murky, there have been a number of police arrests, they're mad in scandal, and there seems to be no end in sight. In the meantime, people are wondering if the future that is on offer for their kids is going to be anywhere like the future that they had envisaged, and they deserve better. Now, for a long time, they didn't have an alternative, but... Now that Labour is ahead in the polls in the United Kingdom, there is an alternative. They could rid themselves of the Tory government in Westminster and they could rid themselves of this failing government in Holyrood as well. I um, I just want to talk a little bit more about the alternative, as you, said, as you put it, as, sure. as, as Labour, because look, in these interviews, you know, we spent time criticising the Conservatives, we spent time criticising the SNP. And it does feel, in many ways, you know, the stars are aligning for a Labour victory because of what is happening with the other parties. But I guess some of our viewers might be thinking... It's almost like Labour's just going to get in by default, not because you're presenting a particularly exciting vision or, like, a great big idea for the country, but just because they're a bit fed up with the other guys. Look, I think the biggest, most radical thing you could do for this country right now is focus on the country and focus on fixing the very many problems that people Yeah, are sure, facing. everyone would agree with that, but what's the idea, then? What's well, the, the, what's the vision? Well, the idea is that you... You start to fix the fundamentals. So you take an economy that is not working for most people, that people work harder for than ever before, and you start to invest in order to create good jobs in every part of the country, not just some. We've so made invest, a commitment what does that to mean? Do does that mean more Labour would spend more money? What, no, we've, we've got, we've got cast-iron fis fiscal rules that we won't borrow to invest for day-to-day -day spending, mm -hmm. but we will invest where there is a clear interest for the country. So the one exception we've made to that rule is that we will invest in the jobs of the future and clean energy where there's enormous potential for Britain and in other growing industries to rebuild our coastal and industrial towns to get good jobs back into communities that haven't had them for a long time and money back into people's pockets. We could start building more houses in this country again if we weren't in hoc to a Conservative party so what's that is controlled that? by how its many more, benches. How many more la how houses would Labour build? What are you doing to planning? What, 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 what's the big idea well, on housing? We, we would streamline the planning system to make sure that we didn't have a block on new developments particularly around clean energy where there's been, uh, this feels like tinkering around the edges, doesn't it? That's not tinkering around the edges. This country has been on the back foot for 13 years because we've had a government that is in hock to a group of backbenchers who are controlling government policy, even as late as this year with a new Prime Minister who said he was going to come in okay. and build a fresh start. They've scrapped local housing targets. House building has fallen to its lowest level since the Second World War. And we've got a housing crisis and a growth crisis in this country. Labour will turn that around. We'll relax. So they will liberalise the planning laws to make sure that communities can make decisions early about the sorts of housing and developments that they want. We'll reinstate housing targets to make okay. sure that houses get built. And we'll work to provide certainty and stability so that people can get mortgages, get on the housing ladder, Okay. with a bit of help from the state, because we don't believe that the state should step out of the way when the market is failing. That's why Labour is the answer to the you challenges see, that we've got and the Conservative Party see, can't be. You know, listening to you and you, you look at the country and, and you're talking about trust in politics, you're talking about this week about, you know, the state of the NHS, yeah. about a creaking public services, about the economy, you know, inflation, still double digits. And we're talking about the big idea for Labour, we're talking about communities being involved a bit more easily in... in planning decisions earlier on. I, I just wonder, you know, you ran for the leadership as well. It was pretty sure. clear the platform that you ran on. You ran on a platform to level up and to take power away from London. What is Keir Starmer's platform? If you can sum it up, uh, what is it? So we can build a country in which everyone has a stake and everyone has a reward. He wants to make this the best country in the world mean, for people to grow, grow up and grow old. And at the moment, what we're seeing, you mentioned the NHS, we're seeing a, a crown jewel public service that was once a destination for people all over the world who are clamouring to come and work in our NHS. And we're now seeing us hemorrhaging staff out to other countries because we can't even get our act together to make that National Health Service fit for the future and a place that people 
desperately want to work. We think we could turn that around because in every community in this country, you find people, no matter how hard pressed, who have so much ambition for their families, their communities and their country. But what's missing is a government that has that same level of ambition. We believe that's possible, but it can only happen where the state is prepared to get involved, roll up its sleeves and move heaven and earth to make things work instead of standing on the sidelines, as we've seen from this government over the last 13 years, holding up their hands and saying things okay. can't be different. They can. Lisa and Andy there uh, talking on behalf of the Labour Party. If you're watching The Take, we're live in Westminster. Up next, we have well, we've yet more strikes coming across the public sector, including civil servants being balloted for action. We'll be speaking to the General Secretary of the FDA Union, Dave Penman. Hello, welcome back live to Westminster. You're watching The Take. Now, there seems to be no end in strike. In strike, there you go, there's a slip of the tongue. No end in sight to the strike crisis that's affecting so much of the country's public services. And if anything, it feels like it's getting worse. Royal College of Nursing members rejected the government's payoff for last week. 
they're heading back on strike and likely to be joined by teachers and others. And now the country's top civil servants in the First Division Association are also going to be balloting for strike action. Well, the union's general secretary, Dave Penman, uh, joins us now. Thanks very much for being uh, with us. Um, firstly, can you just explain who it is you represent and what impact strikes could have? Um, so we represent some of the most senior public servants in the country, um, everything from the most uh, kind of senior government permanent secretaries down to um, uh, tax inspectors, diplomats, education inspectors, uh, people who run our government services. Um, so a whole range of senior uh, professionals uh, and managers who are vital to the operation of most of the kind of direct service civil service operates, but also those who facilitate what happens in health and education and other government services. And what exactly is it that you're calling for? So, you know, we were expecting to be treated like the rest of the public sector. So uh, uh, elsewhere in the public sector, what the government has done is sought to engage with unions. Uh, I mean, it took some time to get their head around it, but they actually did. They talked to unions, they negotiated, uh, they made an offer which was about um, the coming year and also some compensation, mainly through a kind of non-consolidated uh, payment um, uh, for previous years and, and the impact of cost of living. And that's exactly what we were led to believe was going to happen in the civil service. And then at the end of last week, uh, with 12 hours notice, we were called in to see the minister and we were told that none of that was happening. There would be no offer, there would be no negotiations. And crucially, there would be no further compensation for cost of living in the way that's applied in both education, where a thousand pounds was offered, and in the NHS, where it was sixteen hundred pounds. So, civil servants once again are at the bottom of the pay league in the public sector, and so that's why we decided to take the really unprecedented decision um, to ballot our members for industrial action. The first time in over forty years, our union has balloted our members uh, for strike action over pay. Um, I believe you've been offered a pay rise of between 4.5% and 5%. You know, you mentioned, you know, teachers and people uh, in hospitals, the health sector as well. I guess teachers would argue that they've had a decade of pay restraint. People in um, hospitals would say, look at the pressure that they've been under during COVID. Do you think there's as much sympathy for people, you know, in the top end of the civil service like yourselves? Well, whether, whether there's sympathy or not, the reality of it is our members as public servants have faced the same restrictions that they have in health and education. In many ways, the pay system in the civil service works because there's no kind of annual increments that apply across the civil service. That's why continually, year on year, civil service uh, salaries uh, have been at the bottom end of that, uh, of the sort of pay increases across uh, the public sector. We had high hopes that finally the government would treat the civil service like the rest of the uh, of the public sector. Uh, our members have faced the same sort of pay restraint that's applied for the last um, a decade across public services. They face the same sort of pressures when inflation is at 10%. Yet for some reason, the government has decided that whilst they will compensate teachers, they will compensate uh, those who work in the NHS. And indeed, there's been, there have been deals done in local government. For some reason, the civil servants don't deserve the same level of compensation. And, and we think that's unfair. We can't understand why government wants to, to deal with its, its the, the very employees of, of, um, of ministers and, and of the prime ministers in a different way than it does for the rest of the public sector. The idea is the people who were solving and trying to solve the problems in the NHS, who were leading the negotiations with the teaching unions, are the very people, the very civil servants who now are being treated in this way by their own government. Now, if I may, we are imminently expecting a report into the conduct of Dominic Raab, the Deputy Prime Minister. Um, he's had allegations of uh, bullying against him. He's strenuously uh, denied. He says that he is very confident that he will be cleared. So I don't want to talk to you about the specifics of that case. It wouldn't be right while the investigation is ongoing. But is there a wider issue about the relationship between politicians and some people in the civil service? Well, absolutely. We um, uh, did a survey of our most senior members, the ones in the senior civil service, many of whom come into kind of daily contact with ministers. And one in six said that they had had to uh, uh, deal with or witness inappropriate conduct uh, from ministers in the last 12 months alone. And that was across 23 government departments. So, yes, we, we wait uh, to hear what the outcome of the investigation 
into Dominic Rabbit is, but the entire system for dealing with this is broken. There is no independent process for dealing with this. Uh, if you are a civil servant and you complain about a minister, it, it requires the prime minister to agree that there's even an investigation and only the prime minister can make a, a decision uh, on that uh, uh, outcome. So we think actually the whole system is broken in relation uh, to that. Um, and, and that ministers need to really introduce what the Committee for Public Standards have recommended and that we've been calling for for years is a truly independent process for regulating um, uh, the conduct of ministers and dealing with any complaints uh, that civil servants have. That's what we've got in Parliament, that's what we've got with Scottish Government and it's and it's high time we had that in Whitehall. You, you, the statistic you quote on inappropriate con conduct really is quite um, shocking. What kind of inappropriate conduct are people talking about? Do you have any sense of that? Yes, well, what, what they were talking about was um, bullying and harassment behaviour um, uh, amongst ministers. I mean, it's quite extraordinary. Uh, one in six are reporting that sort of conduct in the last 12 months alone, and not every senior civil server would actually deal with ministers. So it, it told us that actually there's a broader problem here in government about minister, how ministers behave. And um, whatever the reason for that is, whether it's because they feel they're immune um, to the sort of scrutiny that, that applies elsewhere, whether they, the balance in the relationship between civil servants and ministers is wrong and they feel that the kind of power dynamic means that they can abuse um, that relationship, whatever the causes of, of it are, what's quite clear is that we face that across government departments, 23 separate government departments are members reported that. And this is not about an isolated incident with an individual minister um, or kind of one rot rotten apple. This suggests that there's a real problem across government with the conduct and behaviour of ministers. And what really civil servants want is a way to challenge that in a meaningful way, in a way that's independent of government. We can't have a situation where you rely on the prime minister, who may be in many cases um, kind of in hock to some of these ministers. I mean, if you look at the accusations against Dominic Rabb, Dominic Rabb was the Prime Minister's campaign manager um, for his uh, election to be leader of uh, the Conservative Party. So that clearly calls into question whether he is the right person to be sitting in judgment of any allegation uh, against the Deputy Prime Minister. So what civil servants really need is a fully independent process where if they feel that there is conduct at ministers that's inappropriate, whether that's bullying or harassment, harassment there's an independent process for uh, dealing with that, investigating and adjudicating on it. An independent process uh, that needs to happen in your uh, words. Thank you very much for being on the programme today. Uh, we are out of time with that interview. You're watching uh, The Take. Next up, we are going to be rounding up everything we've learned with our deputy political editor. So there's a pattern of behaviour that we've been seeing emerging here for some time. Um, so for much of Mr Putin's time in office, you know, since uh, you know, the year 2000, what we've seen is a, a, steadily, a steadily increasing pattern of internal repression and external aggression. Uh, with the, the full-blown invasion of Ukraine last year, clearly that's uh, stepped up um, quite a number of gears. Um, and alongside that external aggression, we've seen um, an accelerating uh, trend of internal repression as well. So I think what we're seeing here um, is a real crackdown um, on both uh, internal um, voices opposing that war um, and um, external voices. But I mean, basically what I call it here is a war on truth, and we should see that for what it is. When the war was launched on the 20th of February last year, I think most uh, Russians expected it to be over inside three days and it would result in the installation of regime friendly to, um, uh, to the Kremlin um, in Kiev. That isn't, of course, what happened. But what I think is happening here is really three things. Um, so one is silencing critics um, of uh, Mr. Putin's you know, illegal and unprovoked invasion of Ukraine and of the internal repression. Second, they're looking for a chilling effect um, on anyone, um, internal or uh, international journalists, who are prepared to spell out what's actually happening in Russia. 
And third, this is about creating international leverage um, over Russia's opponents, so the US and the UK and um, Ukraine's other international allies. I don't see um, that um, Mr. Putin's um, rule over Russia is likely to come to an end anytime soon. Um, I think what we're seeing um, is uh, the effects, the stresses on the system of a clearly failed strategy in Ukraine. And I think it will take some time for the effects of that to play out domestically. I mean, one of the things that um, I think we should focus on here um, is looking at people like Vladimir Karamurza, um, the uh, Russian-British national um, who was jailed um, last week for 25 years, jailed for 25 years for the crime of criticizing Russia's illegal and unprovoked invasion of Ukraine. I mean, he's an incredibly brave man. Um, he's an incredibly principled man. Um, and there are other people like him in Russia. I think one of the things that we can most usefully do at this stage is to keep open um, our links to people like Vladimir Karamurza, their friends, their allies, Russians who want a different sort of Russia and a different sort of relationship between Russia and us. Welcome back. You're watching uh, The Take. Well, we've had lots of takes uh, this evening from the government, Labour, uh, the unions, of course, uh, with all the uh, strike action that's happening. We have a little bit of post-match analysis now uh, with our deputy political editor, Sam Capes, who is joining me again. Now, the one story we haven't really talked about with our guests so far today is inflation. So I really want to talk about it with you because it's such a huge issue and it's simply not coming down as fast as people were hoping, still above double figures. I mean, I made the decision to start the interview with Chris Heaton Harris on inflation, because I do just think that actually it's the big political uh, issue of uh, the moment, and it's something that certainly a lot of people at home or everyone at home will be feeling in different ways. Um, how big a problem is that sticky inflation? I think it's a massive problem because everybody, everybody feels it. And Rishi Sunak at the start of the year decided to make pin a bit of his reputation on halving inflation. Now, he may or may not meet his target. I, I think he probably still will, but I wonder whether he's going to still feel like he's suffering from the impacts of the political cost of inflation nevertheless. Now, here on this programme, we often talk about quite narrow Westminster domestic takes on things, but one of the reasons that Rishi Sunak has a problem with inflation is to do with the most important global political shift really one of the most important global political shifts that's going on at the moment. Um, uh, let me explain. Um, all around the world, energy prices are affected by a lot of things, but one of the things is a group of energy-producing uh, countries, known as OPEC, that um, for years have listened to America. When America goes, uh, Saudi Arabia, could you bring down the oil pro uh, price? Could you produce more oil? Generally, Saudi Arabia has listened as part of a kind of historic deal to protect their security, but that pact has been breaking down. Saudi Arabia now I'm listening more to Russia and to China, who have very different interests, who in some cases want to keep the oil price high to fund uh, Moscow's war in Ukraine. The historic pact that has seen security provided by America in the Middle East in return for keeping low energy prices globally, he's disintegrating just at the point where we're all using more oil. And that's feeding through into the higher food prices and the other drivers of domestic inflation, keeping double digits uh, in CPI figures uh, published today. Because it's a food, massive problem. The food price inflation is just jaw-dropping. Uh, I think it's the highest in over 40 years uh, inflation, uh, roughly double uh, the current headline uh, rate of inflation. 
And that impacts on strikes as well, right? With people feeling it in their pay packets and feeling that they need a pay rise too. You only have to look at something like the profits, the billion pound profits, multi-billion pound profits of Tesco, uh, to realise that there is very quickly political read across, political problems potentially coming down the track. Yes, teachers might not be entitled to a double-digit pay rise as they might want, but there are other factors in there that are complicated for politicians. Very complicated, something they don't always have control over. Thanks very much for your analysis and thank you for watching The Take. We'll be back next week and every week, Wednesdays, 9pm, Sky News at 10 next.